Jeff Andreessen, you may take it away. Okay. Well, thanks, Doug, and uh, good morning. Uh, as Doug mentioned uh, in our discussion here this morning, well, I'm going to lead off and talk a little bit about uh, weather and climate, uh, both where we've been and then looking ahead here for the next uh, few weeks and months. Uh, but I'm going to start looking at uh, with a review uh, of our past several months. And it goes without saying that uh, over virtually all of the Great Lakes region, our winter this year uh, was milder than normal. Uh, a couple of gra graphics on here that you can see on the on the left, we have daily temperatures uh, for a representative site. In this case, uh, we're using Muskegon in the west central lower peninsula of Michigan, but it's it's fairly representative of the region. And on the top, uh, top bar here, you have the departures from the uh, normal. And you can see the, the curved line here are the, uh, the average normal temperatures going back to April of last year and then up through uh, late March of this year. And the days that are above normal, of course, are, uh, in, are illustrated in red and those uh, that are below are in blue. But what you can see is that, uh, la well, if we look back to last year, a couple of things are our summer across much of the Great Lakes region and into the uh, the fall season uh, turned out to be uh, quite a bit warmer than normal. But uh, in the fall, and especially here in this period of November, we had an early onset of, uh, of winter-like conditions uh, beginning before Thanksgiving uh, and then peaking right around there just before Thanksgiving. But since then, uh, and for most of the time here, you can see a lot of red and uh, above normal temperatures, especially during the months of January and February. Uh, and if we, uh, you do the statistics, if you look at both December through February, our, our, our regular uh, three winter months, or December through March, the uh, temperature departure actually turned out to be the same, uh, looking at the, uh, the Great Lakes region, about 6.1 degrees Fahrenheit above normal. That's fairly high, certainly up in the top 10 percentile uh, in terms of, of our, our average winter temperatures going back over 100 years. The uh, December through March period actually was the fifth warmest on record, so significantly above normal uh, for much of the winter season. On the right-hand side here, one of the impacts from the mild temperatures was uh, uh, certainly less ice for less time on the Great Lakes, and courtesy of uh, the Canadian Ice Service here, a couple of graphics. One is looking at the individual season, at individual weeks. The blue bars here are the actual ice area during that particular week. The green is the normal, and what you can see is that for Except for the very, very onset when we had that cold outbreak in back in November, you can see we started a little bit early. But following that, ice cover remained well, well below the averages and continues actually up until the present. Uh, down below, that reflects an interesting trend here too. Uh, these are lo you're looking now at uh, seasonal coverage for the beginning of the season up through the current date, and that would be early April. And what you can see is that uh, for this winter, 2019/2020 we will certainly remain well, well below the normal. That's not surprising, but it does, uh, one of the a couple things to note here about this series, which goes back to 1980, uh, looking at the area, and one is that the long decline in ice, both duration and amount of ice on the Great Lakes, which we've, we've observed here, uh, has slowed up a little bit in, in the recent uh, decade. However, the variability, the interannual variability between year to year, that has increased, and you can see wide swings here from years like 2013, slash 14 to years like the current uh, winter 2019 to 2020. Wide swings one way or the other. Hey, Jeff. Yes, Doug, yes. Yeah, just one, sorry to interrupt you. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that we have a question panel. If you have questions as you go along and you'd like to type a question to us, and this is the easiest way to get uh, questions to us, is use the question panel and just type in whatever your question happens to be at the time as you go through it. I wanted to make that clear. And then in the chat box, I've put in a URL that will allow you to get to this presentation and this, or all these presentations, as well as the recording later. I wanted to make sure that everybody knew that was out there. Sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. Oh, no problem. Uh, shifting to precipitation across the Great Lakes Basin, we've got two graphics here. Looking at, this is for the calendar year 2019, so looking at last year up through the end of December. We have total precipitation here uh, on the left-hand side, the Great Lakes Basin outlined in dark black. 
or the dark black line or thick black line. And on the right, we have that uh, expressed in terms of a percent of normal. And 2019, it goes without saying, was another wetter than normal year over most of the basin. Uh, precipitation totals here across the basin ranged from less than 30 inches in a couple of locations to more than 50 inches here uh, across western and uh, northern parts of the region. That translates to somewhere for most all of the, the basin itself uh, between 90 to as much as 140 percent of normal. So uh, precip during the year and, and really continuing into 2020 has, has, has continued and persisted uh, much above at much above normal levels. Another daily accumulation of precipitation here once again for Muskegon is a representative site. Uh, you can see the actual accumulation of rainfall back to uh, our precipitation back to April of last year through the end of, of March here on the top. And then the line below that is the normal. And you can see that the uh, observed accumulations far exceed the normal. We had a very, very wet spring last year uh, and another a very, very wet fall. It was the uh, second wettest fall on record for, uh, for the state of Michigan. And then uh, these uh, surpluses in precipitation illustrated here in green continue up to the present. Now, if you look here and you let how much excess water is this, and this begins to, I think, describe the situation that we found ourselves in, but the surplus here at this particular site is more than 12 inches. And remember that a normal annual precipitation at this site, we're only talking about low to mid 30s uh, in inches. So excessive precipitation common, especially in western parts of of uh, the Great Lakes Basin. That has left soils across much of the region at above normal levels. Uh, that's what you see here on the left. These are soil moisture percentile rankings with one being the lowest historically or relative to history and 99 being the highest. And you can see there's a large area of the basin and the central and western parts of the basin at 99th percentile. So that's the wettest, at least on this, uh, this particular period of record for this product from uh, NOAA CPC. On the right-hand side, you can see start a stream flow, so surface water conditions. And interestingly, it does vary. This one uh, is varies by the region, uh, ranging from above normal stream flow across the west, and that's, that's where we've had the greatest precipitation. But there are a few spots here in the far eastern part, the lower lakes, where, we're, where stream flow is actually running at a little bit below normal. But, but collectively, uh, we still have an awful lot of water in the landscape, and, and that is, uh, again, reflected especially in soil moisture. Uh, these uh, numbers here reflect a long-term trend, and I think it's really important to, uh, to consider this. As we look at the, uh, the Great Lakes, we have a balance of precipitation or the supply of water coming into the system, uh, roughly balanced or by evaporation or what's leaving it, but it is very, very clear that in the last uh, several uh, years, and, and really longer than that, that there has been a trend towards increasing precipitation. Uh, this particular graphic here, you're looking at total annual precipitation for the state of Michigan, almost all of which is within uh, the Great Lakes drainage basin here right in the middle, uh, back to 1895. And what you can see, uh, the blue line here is a uh, moving average filter to, uh, to filter out some of the annual variability. But uh, precipitation in the last half century or so has increased approximately 10 to 15 percent. So we have uh, on the order of three to four more inches per year on average than we did just a half a century ago. And then here's 2019, 41.82 inches uh, is the new all-time state record for, uh, at least for, again, for, but I think this is fairly representative, especially of the western part of the basin with a new record. The other thing to note is that uh, four of the five wettest years here in record have all occurred during the last decade. So it clearly reflects a trend upward in precipitation. That uh, trend in precipitation upward is occurring for two reasons. One is uh, both the number of wet days that have measurable precipitation, that is increasing. It's increasing significantly or has increased significantly. And we're also getting more precipitation on average per event. As an extreme illustration of that, uh, we set an all-time new 24-hour precipitation record here in the state of Michigan last uh, year in July with a, uh, an event of uh, just under 13 inches, and it actually fell in about 12 hours in uh, near the town of Fountain, Michigan, which is in Mason County here, up in the uh, up towards the northwestern lower peninsula here. But this is an all-time new record. It uh, broke the existing record at Bloomingdale all the way back to 1914. But again, again, I think it illustrates this trend 
of moving both more days with precip and extreme events, more uh, precipitation per event. One last thing in terms of the trends, which I think is uh, very, very illustrative, and that is looking at long-term uh, accumulations over an extended period of time. This graphic here, same time frame, 1895 up to present, but now we're looking at five-year totals. And as I mentioned, for Michigan at least, uh, and for other states in the region as well, 2019 was the wettest year, 12-month period. Well, it also turned out to be the wettest five-year period on record as well uh, for the region. For this particular graphic, we are looking at the upper Midwest, which includes the states, uh, well, most of the states, at least in the central and western part of the Great Lakes Basin, but I think, again, is a good illustration. And you can see that in 2019, that value approached or actually exceeded 180 inches for the five-year total. Our mean, uh, only 148. So for that five-year period, we had an additional 30 inches of water equivalent uh, during that time frame. And again, it begins to show how much excess or how much extra water is in the basin uh, with time, especially in the last few years. Where are we headed? Where are we going? I want to take a quick look at that. Uh, in the short term here, obviously we have a major change taking place across the region as we speak right now with a large, uh, low pressure, strong, strengthening low pressure system moving through the region. Uh, but looking at the next couple of weeks, uh, this signals a change towards cooler temperatures here, especially over the next one uh, to two weeks. And I've got here the uh, some of the medium range forecast guidance from last night, our eight to 14 day time uh, time frame for the 20th through the 26th of April. And you can see that uh, at least in the northern branch of the jet stream here across North America, a large troughing feature, which is gonna allow uh, high latitude Canadian origin air uh, into the Midwest uh, and into the region. And as a result of that, we have a, a fairly strong likelihood of cooler than normal temperatures here, certainly for the upcoming week and probably beyond that into the following week as well. Uh, precipitation during that time frame is expected to, to uh, be at normal to above normal levels. Uh, so a little cooler, but certainly cooler, and potentially a little bit wetter than normal in at least the short to medium term. In the longer term, there's a different uh, signal here, and I've got two sets here. The top uh, couple here is the uh, Outlook, official outlook from Climate Prediction Center for the month of April. The uh, two on the bottom is the official outlook for the April through June three month period and you're gonna see a theme here that's very, very clear and, and consistent, but it calls, I would, I would also start by saying that uh, we're at a time of the year where the uh, many of the tropical forcing features like the El Nino Southern Oscillation are playing less of a role than they typically do. Uh, the uh, ENSO index right now, by the way, is, is neutral. It's continued uh, or it's expected to continue to be neutral uh, well in through the spring and into the summer, possibly even beyond that. So it's not playing much of a role. So the outlooks you, you see here are primarily, you're looking at uh, numerical forecast output as well as long-term trends. And again, collectively, they suggest that the Great Lakes region will average or likely average warmer than normal. Uh, that's uh, the panels here on the left for mean temperature departures. And on the right, uh, normal to above normal precipitation totals. You can see actually for uh, the uh, three month period here, uh, elevated, likelihood or odds of above normal temperatures for certainly for the southern part of the region into the Ohio Valley. And then moving on uh, beyond that uh, into the heart of the summer, June through August here, a similar outlook with uh, elevated risk or likelihood of above normal temperatures here on the left and then elevated likelihood certainly for parts of the region at least for additional precipitation. So the uh, warmer and wetter than normal pattern that we've been in for much of the last few months, at least longer term is expected to, uh, to continue with additional precipitation. And that is all I have uh, for my particular portion of the, uh, the talk here. Uh, I'd be, again, happy to uh, address questions when they come later on. So thanks, Doug. Thank you, Jeff. And now, uh, by the amazing power of a webinar, I'm going to switch it over to John Alice from the Army Corps of Engineers. John, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? You are here, and I see that you're almost ready to start the presentation, your presentation. 
And is my presentation showing up correctly right now? It sure is. Go ahead, John. All right, good. All right, well, thank you. So uh, you got a pretty good overview of the amount of water that we've been dealing with in the system, how wet things have been. Um, so I'll translate that over here and talk a little bit about what that means for water levels uh, and also uh, provide some, you know, provide an update of what that means for water levels moving forward over the next six months. So before I do that, uh, just a couple of quick slides of uh, some water levels 101 to make sure we're on the same page here. Um, so when I, when I speak about the water level for each Great Lake, I'm typically going to be referring to a lake-wide average. Uh, so each lake has a network of gauges, you know, some on the U.S. side, some on the Canadian side. Uh, you know, that data is collected by NOAA and the uh, Canadian Hydrographic Service. Uh, and those network of gauges are used to basically calculate just the flat average of the lake. Uh, and that's, that's meant to be a still water, flat, uh, uniform surface of, of, of that, uh, that respective lake. Uh, so it's, in, you know, and when we talk about a lake-wide average level, you know, certainly at any point along the shoreline that storms move through, uh, wind and waves build, wind setup can pile a lot more water above that uh, still lake-wide average level. But um, especially for the duration of this slideshow that I'm going to talk about, I'll be talking about these uh, still lake-wide average uh, water levels. Uh, typically, too, uh, you know, as far as kind of a time scale, I'll be referring to monthly means. So we uh, we calculate daily lake-wide average levels for each of the lakes, uh, and then we'll wrap those up into a monthly average. Uh, so a couple of basic uh, kind of definitions here as I move through talking about water levels. Um, and again, another basic concept about the Great Lakes that we are all dealing with. Uh, is Great Lakes typically follow the same seasonal pattern that uh, any typical small inland lake would follow. Uh, you know, they're by and large driven by mother nature and so they follow a, a seasonal pattern where uh, over the winter here in the great lakes we typically get more uh, precip falling as uh, snow versus rain so it's accumulating in the watershed uh, so we'll see water levels on the lake decline uh, we typically see a lot of evaporation off the lake surface that's driving that as well uh, then as we head into spring where we are now and all that snow starts to melt we get uh, some more heavier precip events uh, levels start to rise, so they will go up into a seasonal rise all the way through, uh, you know, kind of mid to, to late summer, depending on which lake it is. Uh, and then again, we'll start to see uh, conditions dry up a little bit throughout the summer. Uh, we'll start to get some more evaporation kicking off in the fall, uh, and levels will start to decline a bit heading into the winter. So uh, you'll see this in a lot of the data that I'll show. You'll see this typical seasonal pattern. Uh, that the lakes follow, again, you know, just driven by Mother Nature. And then there's, uh, uh, you know, just the average water level shown on the graph, uh, explaining what I was just talking about. All right. Um, one second here. All right. So what you're looking at uh, here is our long-term period of record uh, for the water levels for each of the lakes. So these are the monthly means for each lake plotted back to 1918, uh, all the way through present. And uh, we, I, I like to show this, you know, for, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, well, and I guess I'll answer two, you also see the red line, which is the long-term average uh, level for each of the lakes. Uh, but this helps to show uh, that the lakes do go back and forth between high and low water periods, at least they have historically over the last 100 years. Uh, so you can see times, uh, you know, maybe I'll look at Michigan here on right here. Uh, you can see, you know, just uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, we were coming off a very low period, especially on the upper Great Lakes, where we were uh, below average for 15 straight years. Um, but we've quickly risen up to record highs, you know, shortly thereafter. And you can see, you know, again, as you look back through this period of record, you'll see low periods followed by high periods, followed by low periods. Um, so this is typically what the lakes do. Um, I also point out uh, that although the levels do cycle back and forth between high and low, uh, at this point there aren't clear definitive uh, predictive cycles. So it's hard to say, uh, you know, are you gonna be below average for five straight years? You know, if we were back in the 
early 2000s, everyone was wondering how much longer you're going to stay low. Is it five more years, 10 more years, 15 years? It was, you know, you can look back at some of the other low water periods, but you see they're all very different. So, um, so again, key takeaway that we do move back and forth between high and low water periods on the Great Lakes. Uh, but there is at this point no predictive cycle that you can really define how much time you're going to spend in, in either one of those. I'm going to try and bring a few graphics out here. Uh, so a few things that I want to highlight. You know, again, I talked about that red period uh, where we were pretty much across the board uh, below average, especially on the upper Great Lakes. Uh, but then after 2013, uh, we saw the largest uh, two-year rise uh, ever recorded uh, on Michigan here on its superior as we transitioned into this wet regime that we've been in ever since. Uh, and then I've got the, the little circles at the end represent the fact that we have been at record highs for each of the lakes over this last year. Uh, but again, note as you look back across this period of record uh, that the current record highs very much fall in line with previous record highs. So, um, so although we are dealing with significant issues, uh, due to the current record highs. Uh, the, we've also been dealing with these same issues during high water periods uh, on the lake historically. Uh, just a few graphics for each of the lakes. So, you know, again, you saw the data there, but I like, like to put this in context for everybody that um, this is really a system-wide event we're dealing with right now. Um, and each lake have, having levels this high up, you know, either above, near, or just below record highs, cause significant impacts uh, to people. You know, so there's really no lake that's excluded from this right now. Certainly, on Lake Superior, uh, we're seeing a lot of flooding. We're seeing a lot of coastal erosion, uh, threatening infrastructure in certain areas. Um, so certainly, um, it's, it's been very difficult for those that live up on Lake Superior. Uh, you work your way down into Lake Huron. You know, visual images again, same story on Lake Huron. Uh, depending on where you are, you're going to be dealing with erosion, waves, flooding. Uh, Lake Michigan has just a lot more of the you know, kind of sensational images where, you know, we're losing more homes uh, falling into the lake due to erosion on Sandy Bluff, uh, you know, out on the west side of the state. Uh, so, again, significant impacts there. Uh, Lake Erie, uh, Lake Erie is a little more prone to. Uh, wind setup events where water can really get piled high on one side of the lake versus the other. Uh, so residents there are dealing with significant flooding uh, all the way down through the Lake Ontario and then even downstream of Lake Ontario into the St. Lawrence River Basin uh, over the last uh, couple of years. You know, those, all those stakeholders have been dealing with significant flooding. So this is not uh, any single point uh, throughout the system having it worse than the other. There's been a lot of significant issues. Uh, for uh, stakeholders all throughout the Great Lakes right now. Uh, don't need to talk too much. Uh, Jeff did a good job covering uh, this data about how wet it's been uh, over the last uh, handful of years. Uh, the one thing I do want to point out, though, uh, yeah, I won't have enough time to talk a lot of it in detail. Maybe I'll be able to help in some questions. Um, I, I do want to note that uh, there are a couple of control points throughout the Great Lakes system uh, where the international control boards can manage the outflow from one lake to the other. Uh, one is from Lake Superior uh, down into Michigan Huron, and the other is uh, the outlet of Lake Ontario into the St. Lawrence River Basin. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, the key takeaway with that is that the amount of control that we have on, or the amount of impact we have on water levels through controlling outflows uh, are relatively small, and especially compared to the amount of water we've been dealing with. Um, it's one thing when you have one lake that's very high and other lakes that are low, and maybe you can help balance a little bit. But when you are looking across the board at all lakes being near record highs, uh, in a situation like this, there's just very little that uh, outflow uh, regulation can do. So uh, that leads me into what that means for water levels moving forward. Uh, so let me orient you uh, to this graphic. I have this for each of the lakes here in the next handful of slides. Uh, so this is the uh, six-month forecast of water levels that the Army Corps produces. Uh, we coordinate this. Uh, we coordinate the data with Environment Climate Change Canada. And so what you're looking at here, you see uh, uh, you see the monthly mean water levels plotted. Uh, the red line is the recorded level going back 2018 and then all the way through March of this year. 
uh, the blue lines, uh, uh, the average, the long-term average for each of those months. So you can see, you know, if you were to follow a typical season, you'd be following that blue uh, long-term average line. Uh, you'll see noted in the top and bottom bars with years on them. Those are the, uh, that's where the record high monthly mean is for each month uh, with the year that it was set along with the record low uh, monthly mean with the year that those record lows were set. So uh, some things to point out uh, when you're looking at Lake Superior, uh, again, is that uh, Lake Superior set new record high monthly means last year, uh, straight, you know, all the way through May through September. Um, those weren't much higher than previous record highs, uh, but certainly a major impact to those up on Lake Superior. Um, you can see we had a little relief on Superior, a little bit drier over the winter, um, and it's gotten us just below record highs in March. Um, but again, I think, uh, I believe January and February were again both uh, record highs uh, here in 2020. So we're just a little bit below in March. Um, a thing you'll see, uh, what you'll see here on Lake Superior, and you'll see this on all the rest of the lakes as well, uh, is that Superior is now starting its seasonal rise. Uh, so, you know, that's important to note that the one thing if you're setting a February or March uh, record high level for that month, but those are relatively low uh, water levels, you know, in the seasonal cycle. So now we're really going to see, you know, some of the impacts start to kick back up as water levels rise towards their seasonal peaks later in the summer. Uh, the forecast there, and I guess I should explain that too. Uh, looking ahead, what you're seeing is a most probable line for our forecast. That's the green dash line. Uh, and then you'll see the, the red shading around that. That's our 90% uh, confidence interval. So obviously if we see pretty wet conditions, we would expect levels could ride up near the top of that band. Uh, if we you know, see really dry conditions, levels could track closer to the bottom of that band. Um, so when you look out at uh, uh, that peak for Lake Superior, you can see there the most probable is right about the same peak that we had uh, back in 2019. Michigan Huron uh, is, you know, a little bit of an outlier here in that it was wetter over the winter and you can see how uh, whereas you typically see a seasonal decline uh, in Michigan here on uh, throughout the winter, levels held really flat uh, all the way through the winter and early spring. So uh, that really is you know, had levels start 2020 much higher than they were in 2019, uh, you know, well above record highs for January, February, and March already, uh, with the forecast projecting uh, new monthly mean record highs all the way through the forecast period. I think maybe that's a high in September. Uh, but what that means compared to last year is if you follow that most probable line, uh, that uh, seasonal peak would be roughly four inches higher than the peak we experienced last year, uh, which fell just shy of a record high uh, in July. And uh, if we follow that wet side of the band, it could be as high as 10 inches higher than we were last year for the peak. And if we get some relief and we get some dry conditions and we're following that lower edge of the band, uh, then that peak uh, level in June, July would be about two to three inches lower than it was last year. So uh, either way, the takeaway point for Michigan here on is, you know, le levels remain very high, even if they aren't at record highs, uh, they'll be very close to record highs. So we certainly have been urging uh, residents to be prepared for levels very similar and impacts very similar to uh, last year. Lake St. Clair, uh, Obviously, you know, it's going to be very heavily influenced by levels on Michigan and Huron and Erie. And so the forecast follows very similar pattern. You know, you can see the record highs were also set on Lake St. Clair, you know, May through September last year. Uh, and again, we set a record high in March and we're expecting at least the next uh, two months, maybe three to set new monthly mean record highs. So uh, again, very high water on Lake St. Clair. Lake Erie, very similar story. Uh, following through record highs all the way through last year, you know, May through September. Um, I can't remember, I think it was the June monthly mean was the highest monthly mean recorded for any month. So you can see that that was the highest, uh, record, you know, highest uh, monthly mean in our uh, coordinated period of record. Uh, so we started this year very high again, and we're expecting very similar peaks to last year 
uh, under average conditions. And again, water could be higher, um, you know, than we experienced last year as well. Uh, finally, uh, Lake Ontario, so all the way downstream end of the system. Uh, you can see, you'll note, uh, you know, we have a very large 90% uh, confidence band for Lake Ontario. Uh, and that's because of, you know, the, the regulation plan there has a little bit more influence on the levels, uh, but it's, an, it's highly dependent on the conditions downstream, you know, on the St. Lawrence uh, Seaway as well. Um, and if it's very wet down there, it's harder to release water, you know, so you, you just have a lot more unknown uh, in conditions and forecast conditions. Um, so certainly still though, you, know, you can see the most probable line for the peak isn't anywhere near a record high for May, June, July timeframe, um, but under wet conditions, it certainly could get there. And if you look at uh, how much water levels jumped in 2019, if you look back to March of last year, uh, you know, the levels were actually lower in March of last year compared to where they are now. And conditions were very wet and drove levels all the way up to new record highs in June and July. So, uh, so certainly still very, very, very concerned there that uh, extreme wet conditions could drive this again. Uh, but at this point, if conditions stay average, uh, levels shouldn't get as high on Lake Ontario. With that, uh, just a quick uh, link here for those. You can go back in the presentation, but we've Army Corps, we've put a lot of information about uh, high water forecasts, uh, what's driven the high water, uh, kind of precautions that homeowners can take, uh, emergency management support. So feel free to follow that link, uh, see that web page, and follow up with me at some point if you have any questions. And that's it for me. Thank you, thank you, John. Um, I'm going to switch over to Brand <clears throat> Brandon now. All right, and I'm hoping I pull up the right screen here. Okay, we'll let you know. Don't <laughs> <we>? <laughs> All right, uh, what do you see right now? Uh, a beautiful satellite. All right, let me see if it, and that should be my presentation now. No, just the satellite at the moment. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm taking it away. Here we go. Okay. Yeah, that'll work. Perfect. Let me go ahead and pull that up. Sorry. Uh, thanks again uh, for the, the opportunity to present here. And I appreciate both Jeff and John um, for their presentations beforehand because it definitely sets up the stage for me. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is the, the, the impacts that we're seeing because of these high water levels along our shoreline. And so just to recap, uh, March 2020, we set new record highs in Lake Michigan, Huron, St. Clair, and Erie. Superior was only shy by just a little over one and a half inches uh, per March, and Ontario was shy by uh, just a little under seven and a half inches. Um, overall, lots of water in the system, uh, as both Jeff and John presented, and so that's definitely led to a lot of the impacts we're seeing in the coastal areas. Uh, precipitation, you know, that's what's driving a lot of this influx. Um, just some of the back of the envelope calculations that we've been doing, we're talking about quadrillions of gallons of net water gain uh, within the basin. Um, in the cases like Superior, it's close to four quadrillion gallons, gallons of water. And so that's the one thing here uh, that I want to highlight is when you look at the water supplies, uh, for example, in Superior, we're almost two times the average uh, in regards to the water being provided as a net gain into the system. And so, you know, taking this into account, uh, that's a lot of mass sitting out there. And again, it's a lot of water um, to get pumped through or moved through the system um, through the St. Mary's River, down through Detroit River, St. Clair, um, and so forth, over to the Niagara and, and the St. Lawrence. Uh, as John, or excuse me, as Jeff uh, presented, you know, one of the things that we've seen is this wetness across the entirety of much of the central U.S. Uh, last year, you know, we were dealing with coastal flooding in the Great Lakes, but there was also flooding along the Mississippi, Mississippi River, Missouri River, 
um, it's not just within our geography that we're seeing this. And so that is having a direct impact both in terms of emergency management and getting the resources out to help people um, that are impacted by flooding. And so this is again just a graphic to show that year-to-date uh, precipitation departure from average. So, you know, what John presented was on some of those averages um, that are accounted for by all the different gauging stations across the Great Lakes. And what I want to bring into uh, account is the wind. Um, we've seen these large storm events, a lot of water sitting in the system. And so we end up with the, the perfect conditions to set up these coastal storms. Um, this is actually from the 2018 October storm that impacted Duluth. What you see on the left is the warning that went out, you know, gale warning with 14 to 18 foot waves um, impacting down the, the long arm of the western part of Lake Superior there. And, you know, within 30 hours, we've raised the water levels by 15 inches. And then for 24 hours, we had this increased wave and water action impacting the shorelines. And that's what led to a lot of the, the erosion, the damage we saw on some of the coastal infrastructure especially on the recreational facilities, uh, you know, in Duluth, the Lake Walk um, and Canal Park is one of the, the dominant drivers for tourism in the local economy. And that was directly impacted with uh, a lot of that being eroded or severely impacted by debris thrown across Lake Walk and, and other recreational trails in the area. And so one of the things that we've been looking at is what does this look like when we're seeing this year after year after year. And so this is the, the NOAA co-op station in Duluth. And, you know, when, when you live in Duluth, uh, you hear about the October 2017 storm and how bad that was. And there was the 2018 storm. And then of course, last year, the October 21st, uh, 2019 storm. And what you're seeing is, you know, oh, time and time again, these large storm events that have a direct impact to our coastal areas leading to erosion and other uh, damage as well. And so we can look at this another way and say, uh, here I'm plotting the long-term average in yellow, the superior mean record high uh, in red, and the blue is the actual water level being reported from the Duluth station. And so here you can see a peak um, that is well above what we typically see associated with the Army Corps of Engineers or the NOAA uh, glittle water level dashboards. Those are showing the average waters. And like John said, this is now showing you that dynamic impact of the wind and the storms along our shoreline. And it's not just here um, in Lake Superior. We see this also in Lake Michigan, Huron. This is the water level station at Calumet Harbor. And again, throughout the season, you see these periods where um, water levels exceed even the record high uh, that's being reported out. And these are where we're hearing from our coastal constituents of, you know, these coastal flooding uh, systems and, of course, the, the direct impacts. Uh, you know, as John presented, when we bring in wind, we end up setting up these perfect station effects. And this is the water level station in Buffalo. And if anybody from Buffalo remembers, here is the October, uh, the Halloween storm that brought in large amounts of water along our coastal areas causing uh, damage and flooding uh, due to this perfect setup. And, you know, there was concerns in Lake Ontario as well, especially um, in the June, early June timeframe, when we were sitting up against, again, the, the mean record high water levels. And so with this water having this direct impact uh, with these storms, we see a lot of things occurring from shoreline erosion to increased sediment transport in the littoral zone, uh, alterations to our streams and river mouths, where some of the streams that are in tributaries contributing are now blocked with sediment uh, because the higher water levels uh, reduces the ability for that sediment to be carried further downstream. We're seeing damage to coastal infrastructure, docks, piers, um, flooding that's occurring there. Hazards to navigation. Um, as a lot of this debris is being entrained, it can become a navigation hazard to boaters, recreational boaters especially, um, that are you know fishing or uh, just cruising along the shorelines. Uh, there's new debris in the water and it can, can cause some direct impacts there. We've seen uh, 
loss of coastal, terrestrial, and, and ecosystems in terms of wetland habitats uh, that have been uh, that four dune structure has been eroded through. It's now uh, having a direct impact to the wetlands that are associated behind that. And of course, we're seeing the shrinkage of our beaches for recreational use. Um, in some cases, beaches that have supported recreation in the Chicago metro area are no longer viable um, or for use. And so that's caused an increased demand for those other beaches that are allowed, even though they are definitely much smaller than what they typically have been. Um, and then, of course, when these storms come through, uh, we see these, you know, the photos like John had in his presentation of, you know, houses that are being directly impacted, and of course, the damage and, and loss of private property throughout our, our Great Lakes system. And here's just a couple of examples. Um, this is uh, Brighton Beach. It's located north of Duluth. Uh, the nice thing is here is a, one of the photos is, is just prior to us the storm event um, on October 21st. And then on the right is a photo one week later, almost uh, at the same time. But you can see the amount of erosion that's occurred. Um, that, that's the same bench. And then of course that it has been undercut. And we see this all along our Great Lakes shorelines, um, whether you're in Superior, Michigan, Huron, Erie, or Ontario. Another example here, uh, this is Illinois Beach State Park. We've been working very closely with the Illinois Coastal Management Program, as well as the Illinois State Geological Survey and uh, several contractors looking at the direct impact from coastal erosion. Uh, the image on the left is from 2008. The image in the middle is from 2020. And the image on the right is actually derived from two set dates of topobathy lidar. And what you're seeing highlighted in red are areas of erosion, and blue is actually uh, deposition. And so here you can see the direct impacts to coastal wetlands, uh, some of the coastal erosion, as well as that sediment transport that's delivered, uh, that's occurring just offshore um, in this linear strip uh, along the shoreline. And so that sediment uh, can be beneficial, but it can also be uh, a negative impact, especially if that sediment starts moving into things like harbors and again, impacting safe navigation along the coastal areas. Here's an example from uh, Ontario Beach in Rochester, New York. This was back in June of 2019, again, right around that same time frame where we saw uh, water levels near record highs. And you know, this is not during a storm event or anything like that. It's just uh, some of that nuisance flooding that's occurring. Um, and it's kind of hard, but in the foreground uh, of the image here, they're actually trying to rework the sediments to uh, basically remove some of those flooded areas. And so, again, it's having a direct impact on the opportunities for our coastal communities to go out and recreate and utilize uh, these areas uh, with the high water levels. And so our office, what we work to do is provide the data, the tools, training, and resources to deal with um, these high water levels. And so, it can be data like what's shown here in the lower left. Um, these are digital elevation models, or if you really want to get to the raw data, we do have the, the Topo Bathy LIDAR data available through NOAA's Digital Coast. We have tools like the Lake Level Viewer, and then again, we have training and resources available. Um, again, here highlighting adaptation strategies. You know, can we use uh, natural based infrastructure to protect our shoreline? Um, or, you know, how do we deal with communicating risk uh, to our coastal communities? So I just want to highlight here, um, going back to those graphics that I just showed um, in terms of the water levels throughout time, uh, we're using the lake level viewer to actually look at potential areas being impacted by these coastal storms. And so uh, we go back to the October 21st, 2019 storm event, and right around 4 p.m., that's when we were hitting high water levels. Um, it was at 184.33 meters. Long-term average is 183.41. That's a difference of almost one meter. And you know what was really interesting here is with the lake level viewer, we could identify where some of that coastal flooding was occurring. And we do have uh, reports that yes, this is actually representative of the conditions that were happening um, during that day. Law enforcement was uh, limiting uh, access to Minnesota Point to only residents that lived out there. And again, 
Uh, I believe the photo that John had in, in his uh, image was also during the same storm, uh, showing the flooding on the opposite side to, at the canal, uh, canal entry there. And then similarly, uh, looking at Buffalo, New York, um, again, this is during that Halloween uh, storm event uh, that had an impact there. It was 176.59 meters um, as recorded by the co-op station there. The long-term average is 175.14 meters, and that's a difference of over 1.45 or, or almost close to five feet of water level change associated with this storm event. And the one thing that I do want to highlight is, you know, lake level viewer does not necessarily show the inundation associated with wave runoff. Um, it's not that uh, complex of a model. And so where this is really helping to highlight is, again, any potential areas of coastal inundation um, that might be impacted. And so one of the areas that, yes, we need to still confirm is this area just uh, south of the reserve, uh, or preserve, uh, and whether or not that did have some of those uh, nuisance flooding associated with that med event. Uh, lastly, you know, we provide a lot of data tools and training, but what we really depend upon are our coastal zone management programs. Um, and each of the states in the Great Lakes does have a coastal zone management program. We work very closely with them, you know, whenever they're dealing with an issue, whether it's coastal flooding, inundation, or just needing the right data and tools. Um, you know, we work with them uh, to, to make sure that we're working to support our coastal communities. And so if you haven't took the opportunity to, to reach out to the State Coastal Management Program, I highly recommend it. They're a great group of folks uh, within each of the states and definitely one of the, the core groups that we work with day in and day out um, through NOAA's Office for Coastal Management. And so with that, I'll just leave my contact information um, and turn it over to the next presenter. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Brandon. I'm going to move uh, right over to Gary from the National Weather Service. Uh, hopefully, Gary, you got the request. Yep, you did. All right. Yep. We good? You're you're, re you're ready to go. Thank you. Ready to go. Okay. Um, uh, from the National Weather Service, uh, addressing um, the high level uh, lake levels that we've had here a uh, few years. Um, is issuing um, lakeshore flood warning watches and advisory for these episodic events. Um, and of course, we're in one today, so I've, I've grabbed a few slides um, to show you. But um, um, when we anticipate uh, the uh, wind and, and the wave action combined with the high levels, obviously, to have uh, impacts on coastal areas, um, we do put out these uh, warnings and alerts for the protection of life and property. Uh, obviously, uh, a flood warning is uh, coastal flooding is occurring or is imminent. Uh, lakeshore flood watches are issued when there is either potential or minor coastal flooding uh, expected to occur. Um, and then some of the western lakes uh, like to issue a lakeshore flood advisory for minor co coastal flooding uh, is occurring or imminent, and that's not issued by, by all lakes. So. Um, I updated this presentation today because we have an ongoing event, actually, um, particularly here on the Eastern Lakes, um, but also on the Western Lakes. Um, and I grabbed a lakeshore flood warning issued this morning from the Weather Forecast Office in Buffalo. And, and this is what a uh, lakeshore flood warning would look like um, when we do issue it. And you could see the headline there that this flood warning is in effect from noon today. Uh, till 8 a.m. on Tuesday. Um, you do have the what, the, the where, in this case, Niagara, Erie, and Chautauqua counties. And then, of course, like a, as I said, from noon to, to 8 a.m. Tuesday. Uh, we do have a section in our warnings where we discuss the expected impacts. Uh, this is becoming um, increasingly difficult for us uh, to ascertain as the impacts are becoming much more widespread with the higher lake levels. Um, we're getting uh, impacts in areas we normally don't. So we're working very close uh, with local community leaders, emergency management um, to ascertain the impacts. Um, but we are doing the best we can to try to uh, uh, put these impacts into our warning statements uh, so that we can understand um, what exactly we expect to be happening. 
Another important aspect of what the National Weather Service does is what we call decision support services. Uh, when we do expect an episodic event, such as today, um, we like to put out information to our partners, customers, and also uh, the public uh, regarding the an anticipated event. Um, this is an example of what was issued from the uh, National Weather Service Cleveland office. Um, if you look uh, towards the uh, right side of the screen, uh, you can see that there's a lakeshore flood watch in effect for like Fairport Harbor, Geneva on the lake, Conneaut, uh, which is Northeast Ohio. And then we have um, a lakeshore flood warning in effect for Erie County, uh, Pennsylvania on the left. Um, uh, as Brandon was uh, describing earlier, and I'll talk a little bit more about, uh, the weather plays a huge role, obviously, to the impacts. Uh, we are expecting gales this afternoon, evening to 40 knots, creating 8 to 15 foot waves. Uh, so the combination is going to cause flooding, and, and obviously we're going to have shoreline impacts uh, in some locations. Now, this is an example of, of what the Detroit office does of the National Weather Service. Um, uh, in addition to putting out impact slides like I just showed you from our office, they also have specific websites based on their water gauge locations. This one happens to be Port Huron, uh, which I grabbed this morning. And on their webpage, uh, on the upper left, they show you where the alerts are, where the lakeshore flood warnings are. Of course, there are several other things there, including uh, high wind warnings and advisories. On the upper right, they're showing you the uh, current water levels and the forecast water levels. The current levels being the red and the uh, green showing you uh, the forecast uh, water levels um, there for Fort Gratiot. Now down on the uh, lower two uh, part of the slide in the lower left, um, an interesting graphic they create, this happens to be the wind gusts. And this, these are probabilities um, that you're going to exceed certain wind gusts during a certain time frame. Uh, in the lower left, you can see uh, the, they're expecting the peak wind gusts probably somewhere later this afternoon between three to six. Um, the yellow area you're seeing there is the likelihood of exceeding at least 33 knot wind gusts. Uh, which are fairly high, almost up around 90%. Uh, the orange area is the likelihood of exceeding over 42 knots, which is about 20%, and then red would be storm force winds of 50 knots, and the probability that's uh, fairly low. But they're, they're um, issuing probabilities. You can see they have the wind directions up there as well, southeast, southwest, going to west this afternoon. Um, in the lower right, a similar type graphic, but this is actually for wave height distribution. Um, and the, the uh, starting time of this is actually a little different than the others. Um, but once again, their peak waves are expected this afternoon. Um, around four o'clock, uh, the highest likelihood is probably in the, the dark gray uh, and the blue colors, which are, are waves exceeding six feet. Um, so a little different approach from the Weather Service office in Detroit. Now Buffalo, um, once again, back to the decision support slides that they issue. Um, I grabbed this from their briefing slides issued this morning. Um, they're expecting quite an event, uh, particularly uh, for Lake Erie, but also for Lake Ontario. Uh, Lakeshore flood warnings are in effect, as you see from the upper left graphic. Uh, the dark green showing the counties where we expect uh, flooding. Uh, down the lower left, what are the impacts going to be? Uh, the very lowest one is the lakeshore flooding impacts. You can see I've highlighted in a blue box. Uh, this is expected to be an extreme event. Um, so they are expecting um, uh, quite a bit of coastal flooding in the Buffalo area. Uh, upper right uh, showing uh, the time of the strongest winds beginning. Uh, they're expected to start very abruptly with the frontal passage uh, areas near Lake Erie around two o'clock, uh, areas on Lake Ontario later this evening. But uh, the impacts of this are going to be high. You can see lake levels may exceed 10 feet at Buffalo. Um, so that's uh, uh, quite an event. 
uh, occurring this afternoon through Tuesday morning. So Brandon discussed earlier um, the effects of weather on the water levels, and that's it's obviously no surprise. Uh, the combination of the wind and, and the waves um, uh, really create uh, um, significant impacts. Uh, when the levels are this high, it makes it that much worse because minimal amounts of, of wind and minimal amounts of waves are creating impacts. Based on the wind direction and actually the wave height and wave direction, uh, the impacts can be drastically different. A small shift in wind direction uh, can change the impacts from one area or one shoreline to another. So the uh, accuracy of the wind speeds and the directions um, are somewhat critical uh, in determining the impacts of these events. Now this was taken uh, this morning, um, sort of the peak time of this event. The upper left is our wind speed forecast. Um, and the arrow barbs are telling you the direction the wind is coming from. So on the western base in the Blake Erie, uh, we see a westerly flow about eight o'clock this evening, more of a southwest flow still continuing on the, the uh, northeast part of uh, Lake Erie. The strongest waves will also be up around um, uh, western New York and, and parts of uh, northwest Pennsylvania. Um, the waves as well, uh, with the winds going the full length of uh, Lake Erie, the, the waves will build uh, all day long and, and through the evening. Uh, and you can see the wave action is expected maybe upwards of 12 to 15 feet uh, for the eastern parts of Lake Erie. So this all has an effect. Um, the lower left is a, um, a water level displacement forecast from the NOAA uh, Great Lakes Coastal Forecast System. Uh, and you can see the red line happens to be Buffalo. Uh, the blue line uh, is Toledo and the green line is Cleveland. And you can see at zero, zero Zulu, which is about eight o'clock this evening, uh, the large displacement that is forecast to occur in Buffalo, uh, that's a, uh, uh, showing about a six foot rise and, and then uh, about a six foot drop at Toledo. Um, in the lower right is a plain view of that, uh, creating this sash uh, on Lake Erie. Uh, the displacement on the western uh, basin and then uh, the, the buildup on the, on the eastern basin. So um, the water itself, and this doesn't include the wave action, will push uh, six feet or more up on the eastern basin. And now you're adding potentially, you know, uh, 12 foot waves. Uh, which are going to be crashing into the shore as well. So um, in this example, you can see obviously how the wind direction is affecting uh, where this is going, but if it had the wind shift at all, uh, this, this uh, displacement and wave action could affect uh, obviously a different area. Challenges that we have um, are obvious with the high uh, water levels on the lake. Um, just give an example of Toledo. Uh, traditionally, before we got into this high-level event, uh, we would issue um, lakeshore watches when water levels were about 60 inches above low water datum. And we'd issue warnings when we expected um, the level of 72 inches above low water datum. Um, the base levels of the lake are currently sitting right around these levels now. Um, so it's it's become increasingly difficult for us to determine when we're getting uh, these episodic events that are actually, uh, you know, impacting homes, businesses, uh, significant erosion, uh, road flooding. So we're recalibrating a little bit, and I think all the National Weather Service offices are working with our partners uh, to determine uh, the new normal we're in right now. Uh, when it's best for us to issue these watches, warnings, and advisories uh, to try to have the greatest impact. Recreational forecasts have also become quite a challenge for us. Uh, we issue forecasts for uh, beaches and rip currents. And um, uh, in particular, last year, a lot of the beaches had very little beach to use. Uh, we noticed an increase in rip currents uh, a lot of the marinas, uh, recreational boating struggled to uh, uh, maintain operations. Um, so we're working with several partners uh, outside of uh, emergency management 
uh, to try to provide support for recreational activities on the lake, which are also being uh, significantly impacted. These are the offices um, across the Great Lakes um, that uh, provide the lakeshore flood services, uh, the nearshore offices. You can see there's quite a few of them. Um, so depending on what part of the Great Lakes you're at, uh, you'll want to reach out to one of these local offices, talk about the services they provide and the sources of information uh, that they have. Each office, um, slightly different information, for example, Buffalo with their webpage, um, but most offices are providing uh, decision support services, um, social media, um, web services, so on and so forth, uh, to support the uh, current high levels on the lake. Um, to get to these offices, fairly easy. These are just a couple web links. Uh, the one in the upper left, weather.gov, will give you the national picture, which you could then click down onto the local office uh, on the map and bring up uh, uh, any office you wanted to. There's also a wonderful marine specific website called weather.gov Great Lakes, which provides uh, wave height, wind speed, uh, and various other information specific to the Great Lakes. Uh, very useful in trying to ascertain uh, wind directions and speeds that may have an impact for you uh, when we get into these uh, different flooding events. And that's all I have, Doug, so it's back to you. Thank you very much, Gary. And thank you all presenters, uh, that was fantastic. We have um, run over the line in terms of going a little late, which I think is okay, uh, considering the situation, not only uh, long-term, but um, in the very, very short term. So thank you for that update, Gary, and uh, giving us a heads up on what could be happening a little later today. Um, so I will say that we have now collected, um, I don't know, tens of questions and comments from you all. Thank you very much uh, to the audience for uh, giving us those. This whole presentation is being recorded as we speak and will be made available to you in the next 24 hours. If you check the chat section of this presentation or of this uh, uh, go-to webinar, you will see a, an, a, an address that you can go to to not only get this present, not only get this recording, but all of the presentations in PDF form. Okay. Um, we will also likely here. I probably ought to change presenter so we don't embarrass anybody too much here. Jennifer, do you want? Uh, do you want? Do you have anything? Do you want to show? And you're, you're, you're silenced, you're, you're muted. Um, I don't have anything I want to show, but do we want to cover a couple questions if people still well, have well, sure, available sure. time? No. Yeah, I was, gonna, I was gonna get to that. I was gonna give you that option. I just wondered if you wanted to show uh, contact. What we'll do is Did put the me, contact Doug? information on that web page as well. So um, Jennifer, go ahead and, you know, there are probably 15 different presentations we could have given uh, today. Uh, and it would have taken three or four hours to do so and cover everything we possibly could have covered. Um, the last thing I'll say before I, I, I be quiet and let Jennifer sort of take it is that we're, we are interested in continuing, if you will, this series. Um, we got a, quite a few uh, questions on climate change and cycles and all those other stuff, which is, which is right down our alley, by the way, and a few other, um, a few other subjects that I think we can address nicely. So, um, maybe in a month or so or two uh, we'll put something together and continue this conversation so go ahead jennifer you're on mute okay um the first question we have um that i think the the folks on this call can address is um it says um knowing that Lake levels and hydrology rise and fall seasonally, and that we have multi-year cycles of high and low water levels. What likelihood exists that our increasing trend of precipitation in lake levels uh, from 1895 to 2020 is only one part 
of a several hundred year cycle? Is there a methodology that is able to give us insight on a longer term cycle? This I'm is, not sure who, if anybody okay. can take that. I know Charlie, we have yeah. seasonal cycles, Charlie, we have yeah. decadal cycles. Is there any methodology of looking at longer term cycles? This is Jeff. I can take a start at that and, and, and others may want to jump in this. Uh, it's, it's an excellent. Or John. No, go ahead, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> uh, in terms of the, the okay. well, the question we have roughly about 150 years of, of I think, meaningful uh, data looking at our, our historical record. And that's, of course, in the bigger picture of things, it's, it's much, much less than what we'd like. But by ev all the evidence and by all of the data that we do have, uh, we can say, I think, fairly, fairly conclusively that the precipitation rates that we are observing right now are, are beyond anything that certainly is in, in the recorded history. Now, going back beyond that, it's it's much more difficult to say. There's there's uh, there's well, there's some confidence, but uh, a trend is also not a, a forecast of the future. But uh, the uh, and one thing I didn't get into some of the rationale. Where is the water coming from? I think that's an excellent question. Where is the actual water vapor, the raw material, coming from? Uh, and there is there is research going on that in, in that. And we know that the region with the additional precipitation, there's also additional humidity in the region or increases in that with time. And also probably in the disturbances, and, and today would be a great example of this, of, of uh, cyclones, low pressure systems that uh, lead to the precipitation, that is also increasing. Now, as to the reason for that, it's not clear. Uh, we, we don't know, but the factors that both the raw material, the water vapor, that's increasing with time, as well as these disturbances. And, and again, collectively, they are leading to more precipitation with time. One additional comment, uh, it's again, the trends are not a forecast of the future, but they are relatively consistent over the last uh, couple decades. But projections for the future also suggest, at least in the next few decades, additional increases in precipitation. Uh, most likely during the cool season, the, the winter, and to a little bit less uh, extent, maybe in the spring. But what we see right now is consistent with some of the projections for the future in terms of a shift towards a warmer and wetter climate. Next question. Might be on mute, Jennifer. One of you would want to take them, but the first is from your ice data, can you project how much ice there will be in the 2021 winter? So next winter. Is there a way that we can project ice cover? Does anybody have any information on that? I don't know. Debbie, do you have any insight on that, maybe, from the global yeah. perspective? Yeah, Jennifer, can you hear me? I'll take that that question. Please go, Debbie. Uh, so, okay. Yeah, thank you. So NOAA GLURL has been leading development of forecasting maximum ice cover on a seasonal yes, basis. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you, Debbie. Okay, there must be a lag. So. Glural has been taking the lead on developing a seasonal ice cover forecast that predicts the maximum ice cover uh, during the winter season. And it's based on the oscillation index of several of the major climate indices, such as the ENSO, uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation, uh, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, uh, et cetera. So we are making some progress. It is experimental. Uh, but you can find that on GLURL's web pages at www.glural.noaa.gov. Okay, Jennifer. Thank you, Debbie. Um, and we had another similar, um, let's see. They so there's the half. Yeah. 
um, sure. yeah, I think there is a little bit of a lag. Um, so this is another quick ice question. Um, it says ice coverage seems to be following a four. What? Go ahead. Sorry, I'm I'm going to just have to be quiet. I think I'm getting a bit of a delay. So we have um, another ice question that might be easily. Okay. Um, we have um, ice coverage seems to be following a four year cycle, the cycle beginning with a low coverage year followed by three years of an average or above average coverage. Looking at this pattern on Lake Erie going back to 1972, I noticed that these periods used to be between or every six to eight years until the 90s when the cycle period became more compressed to three to four years. Can you expand on how that um, or uh, expand on that and how that affects hydrologic predictions over the next year or years. Well, Jennifer, that's a challenge. Debbie, is that question. something that you can cover? Uh, yes, Jennifer. So that is a challenging question. But we have seen more variability in ice cover as we've seen increasing temperatures. We have seen uh, as the uh, jet stream becomes more variable and more fluctuates more, we do see times when Arctic, uh, cold Arctic air comes and descends over the lakes and causes the uh, more maximum ice cover. And then we see returns again to those warming trends where uh, the ice decreases. So, you know, we're expecting this uh, variability to uh, continue to exist with a warming climate. And uh, less stable jet stream. How that impacts water levels is uh, when we have less ice cover on the lakes, we can have more lake effect snow uh, that can uh, cause uh, hazards along the shoreline due to excess snow. And it also can cause more evaporation from the lakes, which could uh, lower lake level. But we're seeing that offset by increases in precipitation. So uh, the lakes are always a challenge to forecast, especially into the future, because of the number of factors that affect lake levels. Excellent. Thank you, Debbie. Um, and we have a question. Uh, it says that over the past decades, the information and in literature presented indicate that Great Lakes water levels were not directly related to rainfall amounts. This webinar so far seems to be indicating that water level in the lakes is directly related to precipitation. Can you please comment on this? I'm not well, sure I who think, wants to take that question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can take a stab I at think, it. I mean, <clears throat> oh, De Debbie, I don't know if you want to take a stab at the research side, but I mean, I, I guess I would say that certainly, you know, water levels on the Great Lakes are directly impacted by precipitation that falls on the lake surface. Uh, the amount of water that falls on the land and then ultimately runs off into the lake, and then also the amount of water that leaves the lake through evaporation. So those are the three primary uh, inputs and outputs of water into each of the Great Lakes. So I would certainly say that I think it's been set for quite some time that uh, precipitation certainly does have a direct influence on uh, the water levels of the lakes. I think maybe the question gets at, um, you know, what Debbie had just said, that uh, if you're going to look long term at trying to project what water levels might do due to climate change in the future, you do have this uh, offsetting feature of even if we have increasing precipitation, we may also have increasing evaporation. And so uh, how you would relate that directly to future water levels due to climate change, you know, that part's a little less clear. So I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add, Debbie. Um, no, thank you, John. You covered that well. Yeah, the only thing I would add, this is Doug, the only thing I would add is that the timing of the precipitation um, matters quite a bit in terms of uh, how the lakes can 
uh, evacuate some of that water. And sometimes uh, if, if you're seeing an increase, for example, in the fall where you're used to having more evaporation and more loss, um, that's, that's problematic. And it's not just the Great Lakes that are seeing that trend in terms of uh, precipitation in the fall. Uh, and this is Brandon, just to add to, to Doug's comments there, it's not just type or timing, but also the typing um, as well. You know, especially as we're on the the transition line between snow uh, versus rain, and again, rain on snow events, that can definitely lead to these larger changes in the fluxes, in both input and output. Um, so that might be another thing too to, to think about is how quickly we're changing um, with that timing and typing, because uh, that will have a direct impact on, on those hydrological flows. Great. Um, I don't know how many more questions we want to take, but um, this one might be an interesting one. We're correctly um, asking about climate change. Um, as noted by John Alice, levels have been um, slightly cyclic in nature going back a century. Does that mean that climate change is not having a significant impact on these levels, or is climate change exasperating these water levels, such as changing the speed of the cycles and chances of setting new high records? Jeff, that one's for you. Yeah, I can I can start with this. Uh, it's it's an interesting question, uh, and one I think one important distinction needs to be made in this. And it's one thing is to look at at, at changes in in the mean state of our our different climate variables like temperatures and precipitation, and from those it's it's clear that that our part of the world is becoming warmer and wetter. Uh, that is consistent with larger scale changes uh, globally related to the, uh, the as the earth warms, uh, but there are in, interesting and important uh, regional distinctions or changes. The other piece of this, I guess, I back to again, I think it's important is that there is also evidence uh, that there are, have been changes in variability, uh, which is again, a, a, a bit more complicated than just looking at whether the mean was up or down. And uh, as we have seen several times, there's a lot of evidence here presented or shown this morning, illustrations that suggest that at least in some parts of our system, variability is increasing. Uh, unfortunately, that is also consistent with what is projected for the future, especially with regard to precipitation, uh, with um, possibly more overall precipitation, but changes in the frequency and, and the timing, and uh, precipitation possibly becoming more erratic. And I, I think ultimately that is a key, key issue here with regard to to what happens uh, with the lakes. And I think maybe Brandon just reminded us of that as well. So it's both the change in the mean and the variability. And it's it's evident from, from some of the, the data that there are changes in, uh, in both of those occurring. Hey, uh, Jennifer, I'm gonna jump in here. There's a couple questions that I think are, uh, they keep getting asked. So I'm gonna jump in and... Um, yeah. Yeah, so let me ask, a, let me just pose a couple um, because I know we deal with it in, okay. uh, uh, at, at, at NOAA. Um, a, could somebody uh, talk a little bit about blue, blue green algae or HABs and what NOAA and others do uh, in terms of predicting that? Um, what, is the, what is the impact of, of blue green algae or from blue, blue green algae with all this precipitation and wetter than normal conditions? Anybody want to tackle that? Uh, this is Debbie. I can take that one. Uh, NOAA has been producing a bi-weekly uh, forecast of Western Lake Erie harmful algal blooms, and you can sign up for those uh, at various websites, including the GLORAL website. Um, those forecasts begin usually in uh, June or July as we enter the harmful algal bloom season. We also put out an early season uh, outlook uh, in the spring that's based on the outflows of the Maumee River Basin as a proxy for uh, nutrient loading to Western Lake Erie. So that's also available uh, early in the spring. We're also working on an experimental forecast called the 
a HAB tracker where you can, once a bloom occurs, you can see where it is in the lake and where it will forecast to move in up to uh, five days into the future. And you can also find that on GLURL's website. Uh, and so the impacts that we're seeing from those are primarily on uh, recreational use of the lake and also on uh, having to be vigilant at uh, water intakes for proper treating of the water if toxins produced by those blooms are present. Uh, we encourage everybody to uh, not have contact with waters that have harmful algal blooms. Keep your pets out of the water. Uh, don't go swimming in the water. And uh, make sure you check the bulletin uh, that's produced uh, to understand where we are seeing uh, toxins forming in those blooms. Yeah, so uh, Debbie, uh, one of the other sort of follow-up questions to that is, do we expect conditions to be worse uh, uh, with the higher lake levels? Or is that not something we can comment on? It's more related to the uh, flow volume that comes out of the Maumee River watershed and other watersheds. So it's only related to high lake levels in the fact that uh, both high nutrient discharges caused by precipitation uh, relate to the harmful algal blooms as well as to the high water levels. So again, increasing precipitation is a driver in seeing both lake levels increase and harmful algal blooms increase. Okay. And then a question for John, Alice. Um, uh, let's see if I can find it here. Oh, why is the projected water level, the forecasted water level, uh, not in the middle of the con confidence interval uh, for projections. People wondering why the, you know, the middle, the supposedly the uh, average or whatever the 50 percentile is uh, not necessarily in the middle. Can you address that? Yeah, sure. Um, that most probable line uh, is, you know, we're, we're taking conditions into account, current and forecasted, and so we'll shade that line a little bit, you know, drier or wetter in that band, depending uh, on what outlooks are saying and some of other forecasting models. So um, it, it's usually pretty close to the middle of that band, but again, uh, there are times where we're expecting it to be a little wetter, a little drier, a little bit stronger with signal, and you'll see that line uh, shifted slightly. Okay. Um, how much longer do we want to go? Or let's see, where are we here? Uh, how about three more minutes? So I'll do an extra half an hour, or it will be an extra half an hour. Um, um, well, it's 12, 12 Okay. So um, there are so many questions on here, and there are so many ways that uh, we can get So we've actually, back. Doug, we've had a question that's um, in various forms. Um, and maybe, yep. Debbie, again, you can handle this one. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and take this question, and it'll be our last, qu our last question uh, for this webinar. But we'll work to answer questions we weren't able to get oh, to. Oh, I think I have uh, a, quite a email. delay on my side. Sure, um, and I don't know if you can hear me because I have, um, I, I think I have a delay on my side, um, but are you able to distinguish between precipitation and inflows versus the outflow and then correlate corresponding effects to lake levels in the lakes? John, why don't you answer that question for us? Um. Yeah, let's see if I'm addressing this directly, but yes. Um, so we have very good uh, ways at estimating exactly how much precipitation is falling on the lake, uh, how much uh, we estimate and model, how much water is running off uh, from each of the tributaries into the lake. Um, and we have ways of modeling uh, the amount of evaporation is leaving. So we do have ways to somewhat measure and model each of those. So uh, we can pretty directly contribute or uh, attribute uh, 
how much of a water level rise or fall we're seeing due to each of those components, so precip being included in that. All right, thank you. Hey, thanks everybody, and thanks for everybody for sticking around so long. I hate to be so abrupt and um, and stop this, but I think we've come to the end. Okay. This. And this. Thank you. Go ahead. Yep. And so what we will do is put this all online. Hopefully, you saw. The other thing I will attempt to do is send out, uh, or Jennifer or I will do this. Uh, send out to everyone the address to get uh, the recording and other information. Um, and such. So thank you very much for attending, uh, for all of the participants and presenters. Uh, stay well, and I'm going to stop the recording and say goodbye.